Life is full of highs and lows. And now let me illustrate this. On March 3rd of this year, we had a staff meeting at our very own Linda Moman's house. And as we sat on her back porch, we thanked God for all the good things he was doing at New Heights Church. We thanked him for how he was growing our church spiritually and numerically. And then we began to dream about more ministries. We began to dream about more church planning opportunities overseas and more church planning opportunities in the United States. We were just praising God for what he was doing. We felt like the sky was the limit. And then, well then, as you know, a global pandemic hit. And 12 days later, we were not only canceling some of the, the ministry events we were just, that we were just thanking God for, but we, we were canceling church. We were canceling church. Canceling the indoor Sunday morning expression of New Heights Church. And 21 weeks and 147 days later, we still haven't met indoors. You know, we, we often move from incredible heights to devastating lows. And sometimes it all happens in just a few days or even hours or even seconds. One minute we're planning a dream vacation. The next we're planning a funeral. One moment we're celebrating a new job and the next minute we're getting downsized. One day, you think your marriage couldn't get any better. And the next day, your spouse is telling you, I'm done. Life is filled with ups and downs, and some of these are drastic. Last, last week, we looked at one of, those, one of those highs in the life of the disciples. Last week, Jim taught on the transfiguration. Jesus went up into the mountain with, with Peter and the sons of thunder, James and John. And you remember that he was transfigured there. Now get this, they saw his glory. They were literally taken into the eternal kingdom. They saw Moses, what's Moses doing there? Elijah talking with Jesus about his departure, about his death, his resurrection, and his ascension back into heaven, his ascension back to the Father. And this was an unbelievable experience. This was a glimpse of eternity, a glimpse of Christ in his glory, a glimpse of the glorified saints. And not only that, they heard the audible voice of God. Are you kidding me? The audible voice of God? But guess what? They had to come back down from the mountain. Do me a favor. Open your Bibles and Bible devices to Mark chapter 9 as we continue our study in the Gospel of Mark. Now, I don't always do this, but this morning I want to read the entire account so we can feel the emotion and the effects of the passage. Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. When they, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as, they, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and, and they ran to greet him. What, what, are, what are you arguing with them about, Jesus asked. Well, a man in the crowd answered, teacher, master, rabbi, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to drive, drive out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said, you unbelieving genera generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought, they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It, it, it has often thrown him in, into fire or water to try and kill him. But, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I, I do believe, I, I do, but help me, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Now, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. 
This morning's teach will actually be a compilation of Mark 9, Matthew 17, and Luke chapter 9, as they all bring different layers and texture to the story. But let's go back to Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Luke's account tells us that it tells us it was the next day, the very next day they came down from the mountain, down from the dazzling drama of the eternal kingdom, down, down from that experience of seeing the eternal nature of Jesus unveiled and the shining glory of the Shekinah flowing through him. And let's be honest, we were glad to be there with them. We understood why Peter said, let's build three shelters and stay here. Because when they came down, we had to come down too. Mark brings brings us all down from that mountain. And when we come down from the glory of that experience, we come into a troubled, corrupt, wicked, painful, sinful world. And reality hits us right in the face. We come out of the realm of God and into the realm of men. We come out of the kingdom of Christ into the kingdom of Satan. And that's what Jesus and his three disciples come down to. They come come right into a, a, a power encounter, into spiritual warfare. Notice that the Father says in verse Verse 17, that my son is possessed by a spirit. Do me a favor, please write this down. This wasn't psychological or physiological or metaphorical. It was spiritual. It was an actual demon. In Jesus' ministry, he faced demons all the time. Demons were all around in Jesus' time, and they're around today. Let me also just say that every parent can relate to this father's cry for help. Our hearts go out for our children, especially when they have an illness or a problem that we we just can't fix. Verse 21 says that Jesus asked his father how long the boy suffered from this problem. And the father replied, from childhood. Meaning that most likely the boy was a young teenager now. Other boys his age were were learning to trade and beginning to to look forward to the the responsibilities of, of manhood. But this boy's life was being ruined by Satan. Please hear this. God doesn't ruin lives, but Satan does. It's really important that we understand this. So this is our first point this morning, and we have to hear this truth. God is always, always good, and Satan is always, always evil. So think about a boy who's entering into middle school, and he has a horrible condition. He's being physically attacked by an unclean spirit, a demon. If you forget everything that I say this morning, I want you to remember this. God is good. Satan is bad. I know that sounds simple, but what's amazing is some people get get confused about that because of Eastern religion or pantheism, where God is good and evil and all is one, you know, the yin and the yang. But the Bible says God is good and Satan is evil. God is only always altogether good. Satan is only always altogether bad. Thus, There's a conflict between God and Satan. God is creator. Satan is the created being who's rebelled against God. With Satan, there are unclean, unholy, unhelpful angels called demons. And we see repeatedly in Jesus' ministry, these kingdoms collide in conflict with Satan. And those who are suffering from his work are presented before Jesus to be conquered and delivered through the power of God present in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And here the battlefield is the body of a teenage boy. And Mark is trying to get us to emotionally identify. For those of you who are dads, imagine this is your son. This is your boy. Our text says that sometimes this unclean, unholy spirit, this demon would take the boy and throw his body into the fire. It also says that sometimes it would throw him into water. Why? Because Satan is a murderer. That's what Jesus says in John's gospel. He's always about death and killing. He's never about life and joy. Now, if you're a parent, imagine this. Imagine a boy who has the equivalent of epileptic seizures, who is overtaken by a demon, whose body is ravaged and racked. This boy is, is covered in burn marks and scars and scabs, And you have no idea when this demon might attack and harm him. And occasionally, an 
Occasionally, if he's rendered mute, that means he won't scream or cry for help if he's burning or drowning. This father is in a desperate condition. This has been his whole life. Essentially, it's always been like this. And Luke's account says he comes to Jesus and he says, he says, Jesus, he's my only son. Please help me. And the truth is that some people do have physical, emotional, and chemical troubles. But sometimes it's demonic. In this case, it's demonic. So we have to remember that God is good and Satan is evil. And we can't forget that, we can't forget that because what will happen is, is when we're suffering or someone we love is suffering, Satan will whisper in our ear and he'll say, God has done this to you. Where is your God now? He could have stopped this. The truth is, when God was done with his work, he said that everything was very what? Good. Was there suffering? No. Sickness? No. Death? No. Then Satan arrives, lies to, tempts our first parents. They participate with him in his rebellion against God. And sin, suffering, sickness, and death comes into human history. God is good. Satan is evil. So it's Satan that causes suffering. Satan is bad, and he's real. And some of you would say, you know, I don't believe in a devil. I really don't believe in a spiritual evil. And I would lovingly say that you've already succumbed to his greatest lie. To tell you that he does not exist so that you will overlook him. And just continue forward, just continue forward with your life, oblivious to the fact that there really is a war. There really is an enemy. And there really are casualties. There is darkness and light. There are lies and there is truth. There is Satan and there is God. There is a heaven and there is a hell. Jim often quotes the late Christian artist and teacher Keith Green. So this morning, I thought I would get in on the action. Here are some of the lyrics from his song, No One Believes in Me Anymore. And, and in this song, Satan, Satan is the one singing, so to speak. And he says this, Oh, my job keeps getting easier as time keeps slipping away. I can imitate your brightest light and make your night look just like day. I put some truth in every lie to tickle itching ears. Everyone likes a winner. With my help, you're guaranteed to win. And hey, man, you ain't no sinner. You've got the truth within. And as your life slips by, you believe the lie that you did it on your own. But don't worry. I'll be there to help you share our dark eternal home. Forgive me. It's easy to get caught up in the greatness of Keith Green and his lyrics. Let's continue. So Satan is so horrendous that he actually sends a demon. And let me just remind us that Satan is not equal to God. He's a created being, but he's powerful nonetheless. And he commissions one of his demons to what? To attack a boy. Some of you are curious about the darkness and spirituality. You're fascinated with perhaps dark, dark spirituality, with Wiccans and witchcraft, the occult, clairvoyance, power, supernatural ability. Some of you have what you believe to be spiritual insight or power or a comforting spirit or a guiding force. Here the Bible shows us what demons do. Here, you want to know what they do? They pick on children and they torment teenage boys and they break fathers' hearts. Trust me, there's nothing in Satan that is of any benefit to you. There's nothing that a demon could bring to you that would be of benefit to you because Satan causes suffering. And this boy is, to be sure, is suffering. So, who can fix this? Secondly, this morning, we see that only Jesus can defeat Satan through his followers. But we have to actually believe and pray. So this demon was destroying the boy physically, emotionally, spiritually, and socially. And not just the boy, I want us to hear this, but he was destroying the entire family. The family now becomes defined by the problem. This is now the family with demon boy. Uh-oh, here he comes. Keep the kids away. It's, it's the family with the demon boy. So we can imagine the desperation of the father when he says in verse 18, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but, but, they, but they couldn't do it. He brought his son to the disciples. Okay, you guys. I know you're trained by Jesus. You're an extension of who he is. I've heard about all the things you've been doing in Jesus' name. My son is suffering. I've heard that you guys have a demon casting out ministry. 
My son has a, has a demon. Do it. Cast the demon. Cast the demon out. It didn't work. Why? Did God fail? No. So what happened? Well, that's what the disciples are thinking. So they go on to ask Jesus that very same question in verse 28. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately. They're embarrassed. Hey, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this, this kind can come out only by prayer. The disciples asked, why couldn't we cast the demon out? Jesus' answer was, you should have prayed. Do me a favor, please write this down. We can't do Jesus' work without Jesus' power, and we access Jesus' power only through prayer. Think of it this way, an, elect an electronic device and an outlet. The electronic device is without power unless it's plugged into the outlet. Prayer is like that. Jesus is the living God, and we have spiritual life, authority, and power, and we're plugged into Him by prayer. But if we don't really talk to Him, then we're disconnected from the source of spiritual authority, power, and life. Here's a very convicting quote from the late Henry Nouwen. He wrote this, We have fallen into the temptation of separating ministry from spirituality, service from prayer. Our demons say, we are too busy to pray. We have too many needs to attend to, too many people to respond to, too many wounds to heal. Prayer is a luxury, something to do during a free hour, a day, a day away from work or on a retreat. So basically, he looks at the disciples and says, you thought you could go out and do ministry and cast out demons and command unclean spirits in my name. And you stopped believing in me. And even worse, you didn't even talk to me. You didn't even pray. You weren't even seeking help or guidance or, or power. You're like, you know what? We got this covered. We can do this on our own. We went through demon casting out school. Back in Mark chapter 3, we kicked out a few demons already. We know what we're doing. We got this. No need to pray today. We're just, we're just going to go to work. Now let me ask us a question. How much of our life is like that? We say, you know what? I've been married for some time. I think I've got this down. I don't need to pray. That parenting thing, I'm pretty good at it. I don't need to pray. You know what? I, I don't even need to pray about my job today. Why? Because I, I know how to do my job. I'm good at my job. I don't need to pray about this decision or activity or relationship. Why? Because I know exactly what I'm doing. I've done this before. I'm trained. I'm skilled. I'm seasoned. I got this one nailed. I don't need to pray about it. And, and talk to God and connect with Him relationally and look for power and wisdom I could just take care of this. My son Noah uh, will sometimes hear dad and mom complain about things or try to solve impossible issues with our wisdom and experience. We'll just talk it to death. And almost every time he'll say with respect, dad, mom, why don't we just stop and pray about it? So Jesus, so Jesus says to the disciples, that's why you failed. Apart from me, you don't have any power. Apart from me, you don't have any authority. So Jesus now says to, to the father, verse 21, he asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us. Please help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's, the boy's father exclaimed, I, I do believe. But please, help me overcome my unbelief. By the way, that's a great prayer. Don't you just love his honesty? No pretense, no religious talk. Just, I, I believe, I do believe, but maybe I just don't believe enough. So Jesus, give me whatever kind of faith I need. I do believe. Help me. And Jesus was going to use this man out of the crowd, this man who didn't have apostolic power, who hadn't been given apostolic privilege, who hadn't been given the authority over demons that the apostles had been given, but he, he's going to show them that this man's faith in, in this incident would activate the power of God over that demon. The boy's father said, I, I do believe, but Jesus helped my unbelief. 
Whatever lacks in my faith, please, Jesus, fill it up. And Jesus does. Now, now watch this. You ready for this? When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and he came out. And and the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. You go, Jesus. Jesus just made that happen. But it should have happened with the disciples. Why? Because the disciples were acting as representatives of Jesus, entrusted by him with his ministry. Just like we are some 2,000 years later, Jesus had left them to act as his emissaries and had given them the authority they needed to carry out the ministry that he had left them. This is exactly the situation that we, as followers of Jesus, that we're in today. But the disciples soon discovered the limitations of their ability to act as representatives of Jesus. They were faced with with a boy possessed with with a demon. What was happening here? The disciples were facing a spiritual battle, a human need, an extraordinary, extraordinary difficulty that was beyond their own resources. This is, by the way, the exact exact same thing we're facing today. Over the past four months, we've been facing some pretty intense challenges. And yet, I want you to hear this. We've been commissioned to act as Jesus' representatives And he has given us his authority. But everywhere we turn, we realize we are in in way over our heads. If you haven't been overwhelmed by the needs around you lately, you might want to check your pulse. These disciples encountered the, the boy being tormented with the spirit. We encounter all kinds of issues that are far beyond what we can handle. A global pandemic people who are in spiritual bondage, addiction, people suffering with mental illnesses, marriages that are in trouble. Did I say we're in a global pandemic? We look look around and we see children living in impossible situations. It breaks our hearts. People caught in uh, all sorts of addictions or living in, in violent or even abusive situations. And we need to pause for a moment and see that the enormity of what has been set before us. We need to pause and say, What Jesus has called us to do is not not humanly possible. So, what's the answer? Well, I'm glad you asked. As we finish this morning, let, let me leave us with four practical takeaways from our passage that will help us, I believe, do the impossible. First, if we're going to do the impossible as a representative of Jesus, we must really, really believe that God can do anything. Do we really believe that God can redeem anyone, anywhere, at any time? That no one, including you and I, that no one is too bad or too messed up or beyond his ability to forgive or restore or heal? Do we we really believe that God can redeem any situation, anywhere, at any time? Secondly, are we willing to leave the anything up to him? We may believe that God can do anything, but are we willing to let him do anything? Are we willing to let God be God and let him do what he knows is best? Are we, re- are, are we really willing to trust that God's perspective on things just might be better than ours? Thirdly, will we stop worrying, quit interrupting God, cease striving, and simply pray? Have you ever told God what to do? I have way too often because I know what God should do, right? And I'm constantly telling God how I think he should handle things the way I want them handled. And when God doesn't do what we think he should do or the way we think he should do it, how easy is it to let our emotions take over? Like somehow we need to step into all all that's going on with our clever attempts at doing what's impossible, right? We want to jump in and be God, which probably means we need to keep praying and lay the issue in the hands of God. And not try to take it back again. To actually trust that he has it covered. Lastly, if we want to do the impossible, will we accept the answer God chooses to give? That is, will we set aside our expectations and disappointment and doubts to accept what God desires to give us instead of what we desire for ourselves? Are we willing to submit to God's authority 
and surrender to his will, whatever that may mean for us. If we want to do the impossible, we have to trust in the God of the impossible and then ask him to do it through us. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we pray against Satan and his demons, their works and effects. We believe the scriptures that Satan is a liar and a deceiver and a murderer. So we ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us, protect us, lead us, guide us. Jesus, please help us in our unbelief. Please teach us to pray. And when we fail to pray, and when we suffer, God, teach us to be humble to pray, even then, knowing that you will still, you'll still help because you are good. And I ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.